or at least a topic that I'm hoping to uh, share with you today, uh, is one, as I've been showing you before also, about the story of individuals here. I'm going to go into the story of Abraham, which we had gone earlier, of course, last week. But now, Abraham and Lot, the story of Lot. Uh, they, they are two different stories, but somehow they are connected. And I think if we're able to look into these stories, and again, just looking at the text, finding something very interesting that perhaps at first glance we would not have seen. And so we're going to start with, uh, I think I have the, um, I want to make sure I have that, the sources here. The very beginning of the sources, uh, I find, I, I, we're not going to go through them, but I'll, uh, I will turn to them and perhaps point out things to you. And uh, is the story of uh, Abraham and the, and the angels, as it's called. The beginning of Parshat Vayera, where the uh, Malachim, the angels, come uh, and visit Lot. And then uh, the... The second part of it, which uh, ends up being the story of Lot, and the same angels go there. So it is a continued story, but I do want to uh, be able to share with you much of what I've heard and learned myself uh, in my studies, and uh, a very interesting thing I learned from uh, Rav Amnon Bazak, who has a lovely uh, approach to this, and I want to share that with you hopefully opening up for you a little, you know, one of the things that you said, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And I, that's exactly what I wanted to have, that re reaction. I am very much a, um, a, a one who really likes to follow the pshat. You can't understand what Chazal say, what our rabbis say, and why they said it, unless you understand the simple pshat, simple thing. I saw before, I overheard about the talking, the, the story about the, uh, the, the Anshayk Nesset Haggadolah and why it was Haggadolah. I mean, he had a very interesting, what Chazal say, the simplest reason is I would give first as a simple pshat, because usually you had 70 Zakanim, and they came with as 120, hence Haggadolah. Um, uh, and Chazal go on and explain that, exactly that. You find that uh, often, very often. Uh, when the Chazal talk about the beautiful thing, it says the Gemara Sanhedrin talks about this, uh, about asking that the Sahara be destroyed. Uh, you heard him going through that. And it was destroyed for, the, for uh, Avodah Zarah, but not for um, uh, morality. Um, and and uh, it's a very simple understanding and a very simple thing. The Chazal's trying to struggle with the simple reality of that time. They lived after the time of Avodah Zarah. And they wondered why, how come it's not a big problem now? People aren't being done. So they came with this wonderful well, tradition of that, 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 that they asked to destroy it and so on and so forth, whereas that, that wasn't true about when it comes to uh, licentiousness and morality. So that was the approach they took, and it's wonderful. And yes, it has a tradition to it, but the simplest shot, as I would say, is that at the time, they were looking at, around them and saying, gee, this is not a problem here. How come? What happened? And that's how they approach it. Well, when we learn the Tanakh, everything there is all truth. So how do we understand when Chazal say this or don't say that? And I always say you start with the Pshat. What do the words say? And what do they, uh, they sort of uh, uh, imply? <coughs> that's what we're going to be doing in the uh, short time that we have. And perhaps, if need be, we'll go on next week also, and that's okay. We don't have to learn everything at one time and go over time because we're not allowed to, so we'll be doing this. So the story of the, the, the angels, and as you know, begins with simply as the beginning is, you have in English, Hashem appeared, appeared to Abraham at Eloné Mamre when he was sitting at the entrance of a tent and during the heat of the day, right? As he looked up, he saw three figures standing near him. Perceiving this, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the ground, he said, my lords, 
if it please you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, bathe your feet, recline under the tree, and let me fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself, and then go on. Seeing that you have come to my, way, uh, my servant's way, uh, 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 and so they said, okay, do what you say. Very nice little story, and I, I, you know the, the story, and it's clear to you. Of course, we know later on that these that angels also come to Sodom, right? To Lot, the nephew of Avram, as we spoke about last week. And that's what we're going to discuss over here. But there are two, and I started with that first story, two basic, well, more than that, actually, but two basic difficulties in that that story here, in the, 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 the angels' story. You know, I always use angels with... Um, uh, little uh, quotations on it, because uh, malachim means messengers. Messengers of God are angels. They're not always angels. Sometimes they're God's messengers over, hu over human beings. You know, a, a navi, a navi is called in the shoftim, a, a, a malach, but he was a, a man. So uh, at any rate, um, uh, this story of three angels uh, has two difficulties. Uh, Note that the story begins as Hashem appeared to Avraham at Elone Manre. Really? Where? Where's God in this story? It talks about three angels that came there and gave God's word and everything. How did God appear? He didn't say God I spoke to him. He says God appeared to him. Vayera Hashem. So where's God? <laughs> where is he? Right? Shem tells Avraham about the promise of uh, Yitzchak being born to Sarah. And the Torah says, Visarah Shomad. And, God, and Sarah overhears what was going on. Well, if God was spoken to Abraham, why did Sarah overhear what was going on? How is it that he, she hears a conversation that Hashem directs to Abraham? That's the both of them. Would see. Um, and, and then, of course, was the famous difficulty, which the no difficulty because it's clear what it, what it is. Right? It says there are Hine Shlosham Alachim, there are three angels, and after that whole thing goes on, then, and you, they go on to Sodom, to Lot's house, it says Shnei Alachim, there were only two angels. So what happened? The, the common and very un, certainly logical, you know, maybe even textually based upon, is that um, only two were needed to go to speak to Lot, and uh, the third one wasn't needed because he had a different mission. Right? That's what it seems. Um, the third one to be alive. Right. Correct. Machlok is also there. Also, but he ought to tell about the birth of Sarah. One of the two, correct. Okay. The Rashbam, you know who the Rashbam was? I, mean, I didn't know him personally, but he was, the, he was Rashi's grandson. Right. He should have been mayor. Rashi had, Rashi had no sons. He had daughters. I mean, they went to Michlala, I think. They knew a lot. You know, they really learned well. So, uh, and one of their hu husbands, of course, uh, uh, and he gave birth to this mayor, Benchmo. So anyway, the Rashbam always, uh, I don't see attacks, but always goes out of his way to say, no, no, look at what the text says. And if from there we say, oh, that's why Chazal say this, that it, there was a source in here, great. But if not, he says, no, look at what the text is saying. He does it all the time. He and the, or, and the Ibn Ezra, mostly he. At any rate, he says, uh, he sets aside the view of Chazal. And he has a completely different approach. And his approach seems to really, uh, let's say, solve the three problems we have over here about what happened. He says very simply, you know when it says three malachim, three agents, angels? Well, actually, one of them is God. He appeared to them as an angel, as a thing. He was one of the three. And that's how Vayera Hashem, a love, that's how God appeared to Abraham, because he was a 
appeared as an angel. As, and as strange that might, as it may sound, we find the same similar thing at the burning bush with the story of Moshe Rabbeinu in the beginning of Sefer Shmuel. And there you see in the second source where we have in the source a messenger of Hashem appeared to him, meaning to Moshe, Hashem in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed and there was a bush all of a flame. The bush was not consumed. Moshe said, I have to turn around. I have to look around to see why it was that the, that the, um, the bush was not at all consumed. And what does he find out? Uh, as it, uh, uh, all of a sudden it says, Hashem saw that he turned aside. He said, he called to him, from the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. So it began with a story that an angel ap ap um, sorry, appeared to Moshe and who spoke? God spoke. The angel, in effect, looked him and he was, was the Malach, wasn't it? Was it? At any rate, um, the Rashbam says, therefore, that one of the three angels was actually God himself. And the middle one, like he said, that was God himself. Yeah? And with this explanation, we begin to take away our problem. First of all, where was God in this story? He was part of the, story, the angels, obviously. How did Sarah overheard, overhear God's conversation? Because it's not God speaking from above and coming into God, uh, uh, Abraham's ears. It was speaking as an angel who looked like an anashim, looked like, looked like a people. And so he spoke like a person which therefore allowed uh, Sarah to overhear what was happening. And um, what happened to the third angel? Well, you asked that question, and I gave, he gave that answer. Why were only two went to Sodom? Because when you look at the continuation of the story, when they went to, story, uh, to Sodom, it says, that people, meaning the two, two angels left, left to go to Sodom, Be'elchut Sodom, Abraham Odeno Omeid Lefnei Hashem. But Abraham stayed there with God. Well, if the Rashbam said that one of the angels was God, that's exactly what happened. One of the angels was God talking to Abraham, and, and they went to Sodom. Very nice. So that's the first difficulty, but I think it's a very interesting, simple pshat type of explanation that helps us say, oh, it is not so... Not so uh, impossible to understand. Wonderful. Good. Then we go on to the second difficulty that I did not really bring up. And that is, if we look through Sefer Bereshit, and we realize, and you know, we will study it, we realize that uh, God already told Abraham that Sarah was going to have a child. He said it back in Perak Yud Zayin, and that is source number four. I used source number three when I wanted to show you how the people uh, went to Sodom and God remained, remained with Abraham. Here in the fourth source, you have how um, God had already told Abraham, Mazel Tov, you're going to have a kid. That's what happened. You have the, your wife, Sarah, is going to give you a child. I know you had already Ishmael, but she's going to give you a child. And that says clearly in the 17th chapter, as I said in the fourth source, look at the English. And God said to Abraham, as for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her Sarai. Rather, her name shall be Sarah. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son through her. I will bless her so that she will give rise to nations Rulers of peoples will issue from her. Okay, so what is he coming back for? You know, God, check out the seventh parak. Uh, you know, why are you coming in the eighteenth parak and telling the exact same thing you already told Abraham? Okay, um, and the interesting thing is, is even those two experiences of talking to um, Abraham and to letting him know in Parak Yud Zion how he. Sarah is going to give a child for her, a son for her. And the one saying the same thing here in Perak in Nechet, the experiences seem very, very similar. For example, in both things, you have Avram Alpanav Vayitzchak, right? Avram heard that 
story in, in uh, and this is again, so, so, I'm sorry, source number five. That Abraham fell to his face and he laughed. By Yom Abelibo, he said to himself, Halaveng me'ash anayivaled. Can a child be born to a man of 100 years of age? Or, Im Sarah havat tish'im shana keled. Can Sarah give, bear a child at 90 years of age? So he was shocked, right? That's what he says. And, um, In Perak Yudchet, Sarah laughs. In Perak Yudchet, Sarah says the same thing. Um, uh, uh, oh, I, I didn't do, uh, did I put it down here? Yeah, yeah, in Yudchet. But it's Chak Sarah Bekir Baalemor. Sarah, and uh, 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 he, she laughed quietly also, saying, Thinking, not that I've worn out, in effect, you know, um, that's what um, uh, means to wear out. When uh, it says in the, in the Torah that actually uh, that uh, you've been you've been walk, walking through the desert now for forty years. Your, your clothing has not balta, worn out. So she said, after I've been worn out, in effect, that's what it's meaning. Beautiful Hebrew, we have to know. Um, she said, you expect me? I, 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 it says, you know, it, it was translated as I've lost the ability. It's a lousy translation, but you couldn't say it's I've been worn out. You know. uh, am I to have enjoyment? Am I, am I to leave? No. Edna also means I should be re, re, um, reborn, re, 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 re youthful again. He said, Vadoniza okay? He said, My husband is uh, so old. Okay? So she is basically saying the same thing as he said. How can I? Uh, uh, she falls to his, uh, his face laughing, as she does. He says, How can I and my wife, give, uh, we're too old to give a child? And that's exactly what she says. So it's not only a repetition of what he said, what God said, but also uh, the similar uh, reactions, although from different people. It's very, very interesting. Now, the truth is that it's not very uh, rare that the Torah will repeat certain stories from one or the other, but especially in Sefer Bereshit, by the way. Um, but there are always certain differences in the version, something new. And in fact, that's also true over here. And I show you something very, very interesting. Now you'll notice, and you have it here again, I did a good job here in number six, also giving you the sources. You see, in the first time God speaks to Abraham to let him know the good news, over there we read that the promise of us having a son focused primarily on Abraham. Yes, he said Sarah will give the child, but on Abraham. And note the repetition of the word, as he's speaking to Abraham, the word lecha, to you. I will bless her, Sarah. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. You a son. Nevertheless, Sarah, your wife will share, shall bear you a son, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season, season next year. Each time it's you, Avram, you, you. Now, given the fact that he already had one son, I didn't say I have too much nachas for him, but he had a son. You, you, and, but he kept on pushing, it's you, I'm going to give it for you, I'm giving it to you. Very nice. On the other hand, look in the 18th, Yud Chet. Look in the next story of giving a son, and here you find that the focus is not Abraham, but it's indeed Sarah. Look what it says. Now, next year, this time, Sarah will be bearing a, a, a son. Next year, don't worry, Sarah is going to have a son. Um, 
This is this this real really focus now is not on oh you have a son Abraham, but now Sarah is going to have a son. And it's almost as if it would seem that that God God is specifically maybe talking to Sarah this time, and therefore it's out loud. And therefore she heard. Maybe it was that purpose from coming, or maybe not. Maybe this purposeful shift reflects a, a different reason as to why there will be a son. Very interesting. See, in Perak Yud Zion, you'll find in that 17th chapter, the earlier one, where God uh, first promises a son for Abraham, there it says, Vayaber Elohim El Moshe. Now, I know it sounds a little strange. We always define one or the other. But Chazal are very careful, and it's clearly true in the text, too, that Elohim is a word that generally is more harsh. It deals with a, a, a judgment type of thing, as opposed to Yudkevav Ke Hashem, which is more of Rachamim, of mercy. So there you have um, this thing that Elohim. Here, Elohim, it means a judgment. For example, and you have this, in, you say it in the, in the Tuesday, Shir Shayom, right? Elohim Nitzav Badat Kel Beker Elohim Mishpot. You know, God stands in, in, in the midst of judges, justice. And you have that in Mishpatim also. Elohim Yechalel, you're not allowed to curse judges, judges. It says also, Elohim, when you have a question, you have to go to Elohim. It doesn't mean you're going to get the bus to God. It means that Elohim is, 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 the, the, is, is the court, the judges. You go to the judges. So that is um, really the same thing one and the other. Judges are used Shoftim, and they also as Elohim. Or Elohim, I should say, meaning not God, but judges. At any rate, um, that's the word that's used when God speaks to Abraham the first time, as if it's a judgment of sorts. What do I mean? Um, because right before that is when God ordered Abraham to give a Brit Milah, to give the Brit Milah, right? That was the institution of the Brit Milah with Abraham. And in effect, what God was saying is, I'm gifting you a son, Abraham, to carry on the Brit into future generations. Not because you're a good guy, a nice fellow, but because I gave you a mitzvah. That's the law. And because you have the law, you, I have you, you have to have generations. You have to have a future. They have to have a Brit, a Brit Milah. That's why I'm giving a son. And the guarantee that the son's name will be Yitzchak is because the promise of fathering an eternal family is a very good reason for Abraham to have laughed and to rejoice. And even to say, I can't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. I'm going to have a son. And that, I didn't think I'd have a... Je God said it, but I, I don't... And I always say, I'm going to have a son, a Yitzchak, yeah. Was it incredulity that... Uh, or uh, many what? do. That's why they say, why did God get angry at, at Sarah and not, not at Abraham when he laughed? They said that, that was incredulity. They said, well, I don't believe it. And if we understand it as uh, Rabbi Bazak does, that indeed Elohim, this was a, a tie-in, a, fl a flow from the Brit Mila. And you're going to have a son because we have to have Brit Mila and generations that are going to have that. So it makes sense. And his reaction is going to be, oh, my God. That's just, I'm, oh, goody, I'm going to have a son. But I can't believe it because I'm going to have a generations and I'm going to be able to carry out this mitzvah. That's the same. However, 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 none of these details, that is, the, the Brit, or that you will have an eternal nation, and the name will be Yitzchak. That's not mentioned when he speaks to Sarah and Abraham the second time in Perak Yudchet. That's not there. 
And um, in Perak Yudchet, we don't use the word Elohim, which is justice, you know, more of a strict thing, but rather Hashem, which is Rachamim. So why is this mercy or Rachamim? Very beautifully. Because now he's telling Abraham, I'm going to give you a child because as a reward for your kindnesses. Not only your kindness, but Sarah's kindness. How is that so beautifully um, brought out in the text? Look at how Abraham um, welcomed his guests. Look at what he does. I'm sure you've heard this before. But live it, because I'm saying it now, so, you know, you can do it. First of all, look at what he did. And, and the, the Torah goes out of its way to, to sort of d depict and describe what was going on. With, instead of saying, and told him this. He goes on to the whole story, right? First of all, this is the Middle East sun. It ain't that comfortable. We have just gone through the summer. He sits there, not in the evenings of Yushalayim, his breezes about 6 o'clock, 7, and it's gorgeous, but in the midday heat. And he sat not inside, the, but outside, to go and, and greet the guests. That's an act of real mercy, if you want to use that. Hachnasat orchim, bringing in the guests. That's one. And then you read uh, the words he used, and we're going to go on to that more. But in the, he saw them, Vayar, he didn't wait for them to come over to him, does he? Vayar, what's the kratam? He runs over to, 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 before they go away, before they, he runs to give them another act of kindness. He approaches these wanderers and he pleads with them not to do a favor for them, but he pleads with them saying, you'll do me a favor. Please come here. Please let me give you this, right? Now let me tell you, he starts with a simple thing, right? Again, these wanderers, these angels never ask for anything. He goes and offers that kindness. And then he runs to get them, and he says the following, you know what that, is, that, that phrase means? Uh, well, you see, I haven't memorized any of the English translations. Uh, if I have found favor in your eyes, if I'm okay with you, that kind of thing. I'm going to say something really wild. That phrase is used 14 times. I don't know if you counted it. 14 times in all of Tanakh. 14 times. And every single time it's found in the Tanakh, it's always a plea for someone else to do a favor for you. Please, if I do then, can you please do this for me? You do it with God often, we ask God that way. Always, please do this for me. If, it's a, if I'm okay with you, can you please do that to me? Do this for this favor. The only time in all of Tanakh when here is a man coming and saying, do, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that you're doing a, fa a favor for somebody else, but you're saying it's for me. Over here, Abraham is doing the favor, really, but he makes the guests feel as if they're doing the favor for him. That's really a remarkable way of approaching. Think of your, uh, really, the hachsanat orchim. Just remarkable. This is a kindness. Why is a story so important that the, the Torah wants to sell the story? So what? Again, it was hot. Again, because if this is the reason for having a child, because of your kindness, the Torah wants to tell us very subtly, so subtly we didn't know about it until we started looking up here, that look at this kindness this man does. And his wife, what he, she did. 
This is why. Amazing. He says, you kach ma'at mayim. Let me bring you, you know, let a little bit of water brought to you. Right, the ekhapak lechem. I'll tell you a little bit of, of a little roll, you know, a little, I'll have you a bagel, something, you know, a little something, right? But what does he do? First of all, vayim my hair. He hurries. And he says, Maharu, quickly he tells his servants, Shalosh si'im kemach solet. Quickly take the finest, finest, quickly say, a bake up of the finest flour you can. Uh, and, and then he says, El ratz Abraham. Then he runs, he runs again, he's rushing. The man is old, he's 100 years old. He's running to get the animal. Right? Days after Mila. Uh, gang, you're going into Chazal. Uh, you know, yeah, it, 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 Chazal understand that as being right after Mila because after all, Mila is just a one, two parakim beforehand. You know, uh, be that as it may, that's exactly what Chazal see. Again, showing you what, what kindness is there is here. But even if we don't go that way, just looking at the text, he was saying that he runs to give this animal by my hair last so so so. Yeah. He doesn't boil it up and then roast it for an hour and a half. He probably put it on a spit and he put it on the grill. One, two, three. Quickly he wanted to give it to them. They shouldn't be that way. Unbelievable. This is just the, telling the story. And that's exactly the reason for the story. When the Torah gives you a story, there must be a reason for it. There are a lot of stories that we don't know about. Let's face it. Now, why don't we know about this stuff? You know, a hundred years away, and in the last thousand years, this happened. What you know? What do we know happened uh, between uh, 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 Noah and Abraham? I don't know. Oh, there was a tower, very nice. And between Adam and Noah, there's a thousand years went by. What happened? Uh, I don't know. You know. We don't know. It wasn't good. Yeah, there are a lot of generations that went by. Why is this so important? This is why it's so important. God wants to impress in you your future. Children of Abraham, what it means, kindness, how to treat people. And the pot lechem, yeah, I'll give you a bagel. That wasn't a bagel. He's a in, slow seam, three measures. It's a large, a sa, a sa'a is quite big. Um, and a ben bakarach vatov, the finest, finest meat. He talks about. And he didn't give him mayim. Mayikach chalav. He brought milk, uh, and and whether that is cream or whether that is butter, undoubtedly before before he gave him the meat because you know. But he gave all these real stuff. The acts of gemilat chesed, uh, uh, the the kindnesses he gives, is remarkable, overwhelming, and the Torah emphasizes that over and over and over again. And now it helps us better understand the episodes of Abraham and Sarah and the Malachim and why it was seemingly repeated in Yudzai and Yudret. Now we know there were two different reasons for it and the God wanted to make sure that the first the reason for a child is because I had to give it to him because he's got to do the Brit Mila and it's got to, it's got to happen. But the second time he says, Look at this man who deserves it. Look at this woman who has gone through this terrible time of, of barrenness. Look at this. He wants us to understand that, and he wants to reward that and let it be known. And that's ex everything we have explained, right? Now we can at least help understand also the next story, the story of Sodom. So, before I even start with Sudo, okay, before I start there, um, we return to the, the angels who visited in the uh, 18th in Perak Yudchet. And uh, we always ask the question, why did they come? Right? Remember we discussed it before, just somebody mentioned it. One had the, had the had to be able to bring this, and one had to bring that. One had to give them the... the um, Sto the the um, come on come on come on uh, uh, he had to heal Abraham one had to tell him the the promise of a child one had a destruction of of Sodom that's the three of them right so I want to go 
a little more into the details again as this is also I think of uh, Bazak. After telling Abraham about the future birth of Yitzchak, the second time, we read uh, very interestingly um, that God has decided that I've got to um, tell Abraham what I'm planning, right? I didn't put that in because it was a short little thing. That's the phrase. Um, um, now, when God speaks to another, it almost says, Vayomer Hashem, right? Vayidaber Hashem, and God spoke. God said this. This verse that it says God had, um, it said, uh, should I not tell Abraham uh, what I'm planning to do in destroying Sodom and the other cities? You realize there were actually five cities he planned to destroy. He ends up with four. Okay. It says, Vahashem Amar. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I have said a number of times in my classes and that um, I hope it doesn't sound too much like an apicorus here, but I'm actually telling you exactly what it means, and Chazal know that. Hashem Amar does not mean, I said, I'm not going to. God doesn't have to talk to himself. You know. Doesn't have to talk to himself. He thinks. Hashem Amar means that God thought. He thought. Like my Yom Hashem Yehior. But who was he talking to? Let there be light. He, didn't, he willed white light to be. That's what Amar means. And I have it in many, many different areas where clearly the Amar means uh, to think, have thoughts, right? So here it is. But it doesn't say by Yom Hashem. That would be more of a speak speaking. For Hashem Amar means not only he thought it, but he had thought it. In other words, he didn't say after he told the um, um, Abraham, by the way, you're going to have a child and he's going to be wonderful. You and Sarah are terrific. By the way, I want to destroy Snow. I've decided. That's not what happened. For Hashem Amar means God had already thought before he did anything, I have to tell Abraham about this. Even before he came to Abraham. That's why we can very easily understand that one of the angels came to tell the, Abraham that it was going to be destroyed Snow. Because God had already figured that out. He knew he had to destroy Sodom. He knew he had to tell Abraham. And before he did that, he told him about Yitzchak and the whole story here, right? Um, <clears throat> so before he, uh, before he appears to Abraham as one of the angels, as we had said, um, <clears throat> he had said, he had thought already that he has to tell Abraham about the destruction of his dome. In other words, and this, by the way, is the Abarbanel, who often will go to the sex this way as well. He says, um, <clears throat> the whole reason why Vayera Hashem Elav, why God, Vayera Elav Hashem, why God appeared to Abraham is because he had to tell Abraham about the destruction of Sodom. Because he already told him about the child, and he really had to tell him about what was going to happen to Sodom. That was the really purpose of why he is coming here. That's his suggestion. And if that's the truth, then why did he not come by himself? Why did he have to bring the other two angels with him, as it were? Um, so the critical word here to help us understand this is a word that um, we often just ignore. Now, if you recall, in that beginning of the appearance of the angels coming to Abraham in the middle of the day, and it's hot, and so on and so forth, and he runs over to them, he has to run over to them for a very simple thing. Because it says, Hashim nitzavim alav. You know, Nitzav means to stand. They were standing there. They did not come to Abraham. 
That's why Abraham had to run over to them. Because they had stopped over there, almost as if, I don't know if we should go there or not. Maybe we should knock on the, on the, on the tent. And then should we come there? Don't know. They stood, they stopped, they paused over there. Why? Because needs <coughs> of them as much as it means to stop there, to stand there. It's used in another way. It means not as sometimes it's, it's um, translated, Nitzavim alav. Oh, they were standing upon him. It can't be that. How can he be standing upon him and then he runs to get them? Right? That couldn't be. Nitzavim alav means he were right there. That can't mean that. What it means is what it means in other places. As I told you before, not only the word Elohim can mean judges, but Nitzav. Elohim Nitzav Ba'adat Kel, as source number seven said, the um, God, Nitzavim is judges standing for judgment. When they saw, sit for a court, so it's, it's Nitzavim. That's the word the Torah uses. So Nitzav means also to judge, as a court would judge. And if that's the case, not to push it a little bit, we will, it means that God was now in a, a divine assembly. How many people you need for a judge, for a, a court in Jewish halacha? How many people you need judges? Three. Three. Three men come with Abraham. He could just tell them one thing. But he had three. Why? Because they were going to pass judgment on what? Who's being judged? Or what's being judged? Good! Sodom! They're coming. God decided he's going to destroy Sodom. They were awful. They were terrible. They deserved death. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to. He can't bother. But he wants to do this as a judgment. And before he decides he's going to have judgment, he wants to make sure. So he has three... And they come, it's a bait din, I actually call it. It's a bait din, that's what it was. So, and he, instead of telling Abram right away, he delays so that he can reward Abraham for the remarkable kindness that he has been showing him. That's that whole story of he's wanting to do this, he's going to do this, prepare that, prepare this. And now, after all of that, and after now he realizes, and he knows clearly that Abraham is very, and Sarah are very um, worth, worthy of this child. Now he says, okay, I have the best in here. The Bedin is here, and we're going to judge, or we have judged Sodom as being guilty. And that's what he tells Abraham. And uh, he wanted to hear what Abraham has to say before officially the, he and the angels would pass judgment about Sodom. And that's when he says, as I told you, Abraham, could I keep back from Abraham exactly what my plan is? Right? And so he does that. And now another leaf turns over of the remarkable personality called Abraham Avinu. And that is his pleas and his argument. A little chutzpah there. To argue with God as to why he should show rachamim. It always blows my mind. And he uses three arguments, does he not, as to why Sodom should not be destroyed. First of all, he says, Chalila Lacha, this is source number eight. Chalila, this, you know, Chilil Hashem. That's exactly its point. Chas v'chalila. He's saying, far be it from you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty. 
Not far be it from you. Chalila is based upon the word chol. Chol is the opposite of what? Amabdiel bain what to chol? Kodesh. So chol it means it's unholy for you, God, to do such a thing. What a phenomenal thing to say. Terrible thing. God, even you can't commit a chilul Hashem. That's what he's telling God. You can't commit a chilul Hashem by doing this. That's what you'll be doing. Wow. You can't do that and just simply kill off everybody. What are you going to do? My God. You're going to put bombs in the beepers and just the ones who are guilty are going to get killed. Not yet. He does it other choice. But... You can't kill everybody. So that's argument number one. Argument number two is, look, right? If there should be 50 innocent within the city, will you wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of innocent 50 who are in there? If, if they allow it, innocent, un, innocent doesn't mean they're wonderful. Even tzaddikim doesn't mean the righteous. Tzaddik in the Torah means unguilty. Not guilty. When Abimelech says, uh, I'm a tzaddik, you know, you're not a tzaddik, Abimelech. You're not guilty. True. I'm not, therefore, I'm not going to punish you, God says to Abimelech, when they had the whole thing with um, Yitzchak. But you're not, you ain't a saint. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And that's what tzaddik means very often. Tzaddik or Russia. And we see that all the time. That means not guilty, unguilty. So if there are 50 unguilty, not bad people, you know, they're not guilty people like the Russia, and if they're allowed to live in the city, if they can, you know, if they, the city people allow them to live there, so it, it could be that bad, let them go, right? You should spare the city. The very existence of a community of righteous people would prove that the city, or let's say unguilty people, it would prove that the city is not completely and totally wicked. That's a number one argument. A number two argument, that was. And number three argument is all the way down, he goes from, you know, 40 to 30 to, to 20, finally to 10. Ulagi mat unsham asara. And what if 10 innocents should be found there? Now he bases a plea not upon fair and not fair, but I understand they only have his 12, but here I'm basically on chesed, rachamim, on mercy. God, please a little bit, spare them, have mercy upon them. Uh, they are, people are weak, wicked. Uh, yeah, you're right, they should be punished, but please show your mercies and spare them. That's what mercy is. Mercy is not mean I'm going to argue that they really are okay. I'm sorry. So what, how are we to understand Mercy, yeah. Is there any relationship to the... Um, I don't think so, but it, it's a good question. I, I, I know there's uh, something about that that I know of, that our ten is because it's a minion, um, you know, it's a, in effect saying, you know, well, you know, if they had 10, they have a minion, <laughs> except for the fact that they were in Davin, you know, and there wasn't a the halacha of minion, but it's an interesting point, I think, that you, you, you bring up. But again, he now says that I want to argue with you not because they deserve it, but because you're a Baal Rachamin. Now, as, as we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, understand, uh, yes, we talk about Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and yes, we call you know, we don't care, just, you know, but primarily what we say is that we don't deserve it, God, but please, you're a Rachaman. You're Ava Rachamim. You're Avinu Malkeinu. You're our, my, our Father, have that mercy. And that is a third thing. I, uh, 